Hey friends, Josh here. I bet that if you were to ask any Christian in our day and age what their favorite book of the Bible was, you'd probably hear a variety of answers, but a majority maybe would answer the Gospel of John, or Romans, or Genesis, or the Psalms, or maybe even Revelation. Now, in my nearly two decades of full-time ministry, and in all of my life as a disciple of Jesus up to this point, I haven't heard too many people say that Leviticus or Esther or Obadiah were their favorite books of the Bible. I venture to guess you haven't either. No, no, Leviticus is not my favorite book. I like it, but it's not my favorite. But what if I were to tell you that my favorite book of the Bible is Deuteronomy? Would you put me in the same category as the weirdos who like Leviticus and Obadiah? Well, I hope not, because I do have Jesus to back me up. He seemed to really like Deuteronomy, because in the Gospels, he quotes a lot of passages from it. So you might be asking, okay, but why? Why is Deuteronomy your favorite book? And what does Deuteronomy have to do with me and my relationship with Jesus? I mean, isn't that why you read the Bible anyways? To see that Jesus fulfilled lots of prophecy by coming and dying for my sins on the cross and being raised to life on the third day so that I can have a restored relationship with God? And if I believe in Jesus and believe he has a great plan for my life, then I can go to heaven when I die? Isn't that the whole point? Well, I hope you sense the sarcasm in my voice because the Bible story is about something so much bigger than that. And this is where Deuteronomy comes in. Deuteronomy can be my favorite book of the Bible first because the Bible's not mostly about me. Yes, thanks to the Enlightenment, Western culture is very individualistic, and the air that we breathe today, even in the church, is often made up of oxygen and nitrogen and narcissism. <laughs> we love to read ourselves into every passage in the Bible, and when it doesn't fit or make sense, and where we can't spiritualize it all that well, we kind of move it to the background, and it becomes just the part of Where's Waldo or the Where's Jesus game that we play when we read the Bible. Now, I have a whole other video on my channel here that I'll link in the description below called The Bible Was Not Written to You, where I developed this specific idea a bit more. But when I began to realize the Bible was inviting me into a bigger story than what God was doing with me or my personal life or the vision of my church or my, the spiritual destiny of my nation or something, the scriptures began to open up in a way like they never had before. Verses and chapters and even whole books began to make way more sense. And one of those books was the book of Deuteronomy. So what's the book of Deuteronomy even about? Well, we've got to go back to Genesis, specifically Genesis 3 and Genesis 12. As I'm sure you're familiar with the story in the Garden of Eden and God's curse on humanity to return men to the dust in Genesis 3, we can jump ahead just a few chapters all the way to Genesis 12, where God promises to a man named Abraham that it would be through him and his family that all the rest of the families of the earth, the nations, that they would be blessed. In other words, that the curse of Genesis 3 would be lifted. Now, the book of Genesis goes on to trace the story of Abraham and his descendants through Isaac and Jacob and then Jacob's 12 sons. Why is Genesis doing that? Well, because it's through his family that life and immortality is going to return to humanity, as he promised to Abraham. Now, if we go on reading the Bible, we get to Exodus, where we see Abraham's family is oppressed, and they're in Egypt, and God's going to do something so monumental for them. He delivers them from slavery from the Egyptians in such a dramatic fashion. And if you read the details... He brings the plagues on Egypt and delivers the people of Israel, not just because he's a nice God and cares for suffering people, which he does, of course, but the main reason we see this over and over and over again is because he's made a commitment. He's made a covenant with their ancestor, Abraham. So God brings them out to Mount Sinai, where the whole nation then enters into a covenant with him. And the covenant, of course, is significant for the rest of the story because of what God says in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. He says, Now therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So through Israel's obedience to God's instructions and through their keeping of the covenant, God promises to make them a unique, distinct nation that's different from all the others and that they would be a kingdom of priests. Now, to be a priest doesn't just mean they're going to have a nice, warm relationship with God and they'll have some great quiet times or to just sing to God and worship him. The whole nation's calling is to introduce the other nations to their God to help them to come and meet with him, to navigate what it means to be in a relationship with them so that they can intercede or stand in the gap on behalf of the nations, maybe even distribute to those who are in need. This is what priesthood is all about. 
So just as Moses was a priest to the people of Israel, so Israel is a kingdom of priests to the rest of the nations. Does that make sense? Of course, this is all in line with God pro what God promised to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, that he would bless Abraham's family so that they would be a blessing to the rest of the nations. But here's the problem. Israel began to show not all that long after that, then when they agreed to the terms of the covenant, that they weren't really wanting to be any different than the rest of the nations. They didn't want to be holy. It wasn't because of their inability. The terms of the covenant they made with God weren't too hard for them to do, as Moses would later say in Deuteronomy. Their problem was unwillingness. But Israel's unwillingness to obey and their seemingly perpetual desire to be just like the rest of the nations doesn't thwart God's intentions to keep the covenant that he made with Abraham. He bound himself to that people group into the covenant, and he isn't going to change his mind about how he planned to bring all the nations back to him and undo the curse of Genesis 3. Now this is what brings us to Deuteronomy. Moses does something so unique in Deuteronomy that causes it to become extremely significant for the rest of the story of the Bible. Deuteronomy is essentially the beginning of using narrative and history to explain God's plan of redemption. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, Deuteronomy was supposedly written at the end of the 40 years that Israel spent wandering in the wilderness, and Moses begins by recounting some of the major things that have happened in Israel's history. Not only the exodus from Egypt, but Mount Sinai, some of the battles on the way to the promised land, all to show that God is faithful and that he's keeping the covenant that he promised to Abraham. He's not just acting randomly based on how he feels that day. And so Moses then frames God's actions with Israel in context to that covenant that he made. He's moving and guiding and he's leading and he's responding to Israel through the lens of the covenant. Not only does Moses frame Israel's past in context to the covenant, he frames Israel's future that way too. Passages like Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 28 through 32, just to name a few, they speak ahead to Israel's future and what's going to happen to the nation both in near and far days ahead. In other words, the way that God acted in the past, if we see it through the lens of the covenant, is very predictable. And because of that, Israel's future is predictable through the lens of the covenant. Now, Deuteronomy lays out a simple cycle that can be seen in Israel's history and then projected forward into Israel's future. It's the cycle of transgression and covenant breaking, meaning Israel turns aside from obedience to the things that God gave them at Mount Sinai. And then God then raises up a voice or a prophet of some kind to remind Israel of the covenant and call them back to it. And then third, Israel doesn't respond to the prophet. And so God is faithful to do what he promised he would. He would bring discipline upon them, as he said in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. A discipline not of final rejection of them, but a discipline to bring them back to repentance. That discipline often comes in the form of exile from the promised land. And then the last part of the cycle, there's a remnant of people in Israel who recognize their disobedience and repent. They turn back to obedience to the terms of the covenant, and then God restores them to their land. Now, with that simple cycle in mind and with that basic understanding that God's actions are predictable through the lens of the covenant, we can look forward to the ministry of the prophets and even to the ministry of Jesus and explain what's going on. This covenantal lens is how Isaiah is interpreting the events of the invasion of Sennacherib and Assyria. Okay? Same thing with Jeremiah and the Babylonians and the destruction of Jerusalem and then the 70 years in exile. The use of of narrative and history to explain events essentially becomes the mechanism that the prophets use to remind people that God's judgment didn't mean God's rejection and God's forsaking of his promises. Discipline is maintenance of the covenant. He's maintaining his promise to do what he said. It's actually the opposite of what we think, right? God didn't discipline Israel and scatter them. He wouldn't be faithful to do what he promised because discipline is part of the terms of the covenant that they made with him at Mount Sinai. So the story of the Bible is not random. All those things don't just act as some kind of platform for Jesus and the spiritual salvation that he brings or something. And history is not meandering aimlessly. His covenant with Israel represents his plan to redeem all the families of the earth. Even the story we find in the Gospels, the story of John the Baptist and Jesus and his ministry to Israel in the first century, can and should be understood in this slide. Now, I have 150 videos here on my YouTube channel walking through the Gospels to show you this. Said a little differently, the cycle is playing out again. 
Israel disobeys, they reject God's messengers, and so God scatters them away from the land, and then eventually a remnant repents and returns. This is why I think the more commonly held view, sometimes called replacement theology, or even more confusingly covenant theology, is completely missing the mark. Jesus' first coming didn't redefine anything. There's not some new people because God rejected his old people. No, God's maintaining his covenant with them and still intends to redeem all the families of the earth through them. This is what Paul lays out in Romans 9 and 10 and 11, ironically, quoting Deuteronomy a lot in those passages. Now, as Deuteronomy lays out, the cycle will not go on forever. Praise the Lord, right? There's a time coming when God will act definitively, where he's going to do something so significant in history and there's something just so profound in the hearts of the people of Israel that they'll never again turn aside from obedience to the terms of the covenant. The cycle comes to an end and then they live in the land and all the families of the earth are blessed through them. Death is no more and they walk out their role as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And this, of course, is yet future. And this is what Deuteronomy lays out and why I think Deuteronomy has become one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's where history is theologized, I suppose you could say, around the covenant. And without that specific understanding, the ministry of the prophets, the ministry of John the Baptist, the ministry of Jesus to Israel doesn't make all that much sense. Of course, there's so much more that I could say. So if you're looking for a deeper discussion of these things, I've linked to a couple of episodes in a podcast below where a few other ministry leaders and I walk through it in much, much more detail. Of course, I have lots of other videos here on my channel talking about these themes as well. But if this has been provoking to you to maybe begin to dig into Deuteronomy, drop a like and a comment below. Well, until next time, God bless and Maranatha.